So, welcome all delegates and faculty for the today's webinar. Today's webinar uh, is being done by Society of Fetal Medicine in association with Safe Motherhood Committee, FOXI. So, this is our first initiative of both the uh, these associations who are working for the fetal as well as maternal health. So our today's topic is recurrent pregnancy loss. Recurrent pregnancy loss, as we all know, is defined as two or more consecutive pregnancy losses occurring before 20 weeks of gestation. It affects almost 1 to 2 percent of the couples who are trying to conceive. It is really heartbreaking and challenging uh, for the patient and sometimes also for the doctor to find out the cause because the causes can be genetic, anatomical, hormonal, immunological and sometimes simple like lifestyle uh, factors like smoking and obesity. These all contribute to the risk and the comprehensive evaluation and the individual care is very important. So today we will have Dr. Ashok Khurana himself talking upon the subject and we will have case-based discussions also. So first of all, for the proceedings, I will invite Dr. Mohit Sasar. He is National President of Society of Fetal Medicine and National President of Society of uh, Ultrasound of Musculoskeletal and the Vice President of IFUMB and he is Consultant of Fetal Medicine at Surya Mother and Child Care Hospital in Bombay. So, sir has a lot of experience in fetal medicine and he has a lot of videos on this uh, safe, uh, this uh, Society of Fetal Medicine YouTube channel and all those videos are very informative. So, I insist all the people who have joined here to just look on those videos, sub subscribe the channel and uh, that is very, uh, you know, informative for all of you. So I invite Dr. Moisha sir for his address. Thank you so much, Dr. Poonam Goel. Good evening to all my friends, colleagues. Today, the SFM observes the pregnancy and infant loss month. But this time, this webinar is different because we are collaborating with the Foxy. Uh, I, and I should thank Dr. Poonam Goyal for her humongous efforts to have the Safe Motherhood Committee of the Foxy. She's the chairman of it to collaborate with SFM because we believe that together these two societies can make a difference to the mother and the unborn child. So keeping this in mind, we have to understand that Though we are developing and we are no longer an underdeveloped country yet, we have a very high incidence of pregnancy and infant loss in India. In spite of the uh, achievements globally, we still lag in uh, controlling the uh, maternal as well as neonatal loss. And unfortunately, when you look at statistics, this is restricted to some of the very quite urban areas as well as some uh, very impoverished states have a higher pregnancy loss. So it is not quite average it out of pan India. There are some states which have a higher mm -hmm. loss than what uh, a developed states would be. So if you look at the figures, Manipur, Puducherry and Punjab are the ones where we have higher incidence of pregnancy losses over a period of time. But if you look at the overall statistics of India, in between 2019 and 21, there has been a very high miscarriage rate in urban areas as compared to rural areas. That is something that is quite surprising because, um, you know, though we have been considered as a rural country, we know that most of the educated people try to be in the urban areas. And this is where the miscarriage rate has increased from 6.4% in 2015-16 uh, to almost 8.5% in 2016 to vis-a-vis a 7% -vis in rural areas. So that is quite surprising. The stillbirth rate has also increased by 28.6% in the five-year comparison that they have done from 2015 to 2016. 
What has decreased is the live birth rate and the rate of abortion. But again, the, the rate of abortions uh, is higher because uh, there were so many unplanned pregnancies pan India. But overall, we do understand that the rate is, uh, you know, still on the higher side as compared to what we want to achieve as a developed country. In fact, there's a very good article uh, uh, on uh, the net uh, done by uh, ICMR Mumbai. ICMR is a leading researcher in the, the Indian Council of Medical Research, which, uh, which has different areas uh, of specialization, but they really do research which actually helps the population. And uh, I would urge you to go and read that paper where they have concluded that there, at present, there is evidence of a decrease in the live birth, but increase in the frequency of miscarriage and stillbirth among Indian women during the period of their study from 2015 to 2021, a six-year study. And therefore, they have emphasized that there is a need. And I also believe uh, as SFM uh, member, there is a need for a regional specific comprehensive quality maternal health care programs for improving life birth among Indian women. And the Society of Fetal Medicine, I can proudly say, is making efforts to approach various state governments where we feel that the maternal mortality is high. We are trying to reach out, for example, in Assam, we are trying to connect with the state government to have a robust program which will help uh, improve the maternal mortality rate uh, in Assam. So similarly, if we have one pilot project which goes on successfully, uh, we are sure that we can implement it pan-India. <laughs> but uh, what is important is the intent. And I believe this is where Foxy also can play a role. Dr. Poonam Goel, Dr. Sita Ramurthy, both uh, are here on this panel. I I'm sure uh, if SFM and Foxy together can collaborate, we can have a more robust, more uh, compound, uh, compounding reach uh, to, uh, you know, to women who, who still lack quality maternal health care in their states. And together, maybe we can have a state uh, government collaboration where we can actually provide quality health care to improve the lives of the unplanned uh, and the undelivered babies and also as the, those rural impoverished women. Um, today's seminar is based on pregnancy loss. Dr. Ashok Khurana will actually take you to, to the most common scenario that we face in clinical practice. Though we seldom think about it, but we often get, we so often get cases of spontaneous loss. Sometimes it is, you know, a primary, um, you know, who's completely distraught because it's the first pregnancy that is lost. But sometimes you have women with recurrent pregnancy losses coming to you for the third and the fourth time and fortunately, we now have a recurrent pregnancy protocol where we advise a comprehensive array of blood tests to find out the reason. But we all agree that it is quite devastating to the young mother, uh, whether it is a first loss, even so more with multiple losses. So she is going to talk on um, the, the pregnancy losses in the first trimester, something that we uh, quite commonly see but we seldom try to put that into statistics. And if you really try to put that into statistics, what the ICMR has done, we'll realize that, in fact, this is going haywire as we are uh, calling ourselves a much more developing country. At the same time, we have a decrease in the live birth rate and increase in frequency of miscarriage and stillbirth. Um, is Dr. Kurana, sir, ready? Yes, 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 sir. Oh, okay, sir. okay. So I am um, I'm happy, I'm happy to introduce, introduce. Dr. The Emeritus. Sorry? 
I will introduce sir. Okay, sir. Okay. So over to you, ma'am. Over to you. Uh, thank, thank you. you so thank much. you. Thank you, sir. So now I invite Dr. Ashok Khurana, sir, the doyen himself to speak upon the recurrent pregnancy loss. Sir is professor at Dubrovnik Uni International University, Croatia, and he is past president of Society of Fetal Medicine and former as well as uh, now also he is ambassador of uh, uh, ESOG in India and sir is mentor emeritus of Society of Fetal Medicine. I think sir needs no introduction for this particular audience today. So sir, most welcome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. A very good evening. And uh, thank you, Dr. Poonam Goyal and Dr. Mohit Shah for getting the ball rolling. Uh, yes, we do need this awareness because much as we think that this is uh, such a routine thing and that we may not need to do anything about it, everybody knows about it. There is that element of loss that only the patient can feel. And, and really speaking, apart from the death of a spouse and a, or, or a child, the next worst experience anybody can go through uh, is a miscarriage or the loss of, a, of an unborn child. And uh, so I'm so glad that we are uh, creating awareness of the fact uh, that, that, that this is the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month and that we're going to do something about it. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I will uh, take everyone through first trimester recurrent pregnancy loss and how we look at it, especially with an ultrasound perspective. And the rest of it, of course, will be discussed uh, in the uh, panel discussion. And uh, so here we go. So um, it is, of course, a great privilege to be uh, hosting uh, this program uh, of Society of Fetal Medicine along with the Safe Motherhood Committee. And thank you so much for the idea, Dr. Poonam Goyal. So uh, moving on to uh, what we will be talking about, uh, over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is some background from the from useful evidence. Uh, then there would be a short section on ultrasound phenotypes as a guide to genetic evaluation, ultrasound techniques in perspective, uh, the need versus desperation for third party reproduction, including gametes and surrogacy, which everyone thinks these days is really the answer when it may not be the answer. There might be uterine causes and maternal causes uh, apart from some of these and uh, third party reproduction may not be the answer. Then of course, there is of course the urge for uh, quickly operating any structural abnormality in the uterus, presuming that that is the cause for a single miscarriage and that should not be the approach. And I will emphasize on technology, operator expertise and experience. Uh, so here we go. And uh, let me tell you that a lot of my talk is going to be uh, from the ASHRAE guidelines. Uh, this was the version two from November 2017, uh, which is done by the ASHRAE Early Pregnancy Guideline Development Group. And I'll highlight a lot of what they have said based on a huge amount of evidence. So recurrent pregnancy loss, of course, uh, is reported in approximately 1% to 2% of women. And current techniques can identify up to 50% of couples suffering from uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. And genetic causes account for about 2% to 5% of these. And this is very recent data. It must be realized from this little diagram that I've put up the pie chart, uh, that out of this whole bunch, uh, when we look at this chart, we do find that 40 to 50% will remain unexplained. And this includes the non-antiphospholipid antibody syndrome thrombophilias. Otherwise, the autoimmune includes about 20% of the causes, 10 to 15% are anatomic factors, 17 to 20% are endocrine factors, about half a percent to 5% are infections, and about 2 to 5% are genetic factors. So I will take you through as much of this as we possibly can, except the one thing I will not highlight is tuberculosis. Why am I not highlighting it? Because we don't know, and yet we know. And the story about tuberculosis is the kind of uterus I have shown here with the vertical course of the interstitial part of the tube. And the reason why I like to talk about tuberculosis straight away is this. We don't know what anti-tubercular drugs do. Do they just treat tuberculosis or do they actually modify the immune response uh, of the potential mother? 
So uh, that, of course, is useful. And we know that antitubercular treatment works. But that is something we might just touch on in the panel discussion. I will discuss the more obvious things, such as the septate uterus and so on. When we do look at the entire uh, gamut uh, for pregnancy loss, we do understand uh, that the same ESHA guideline uh, does have recommended tests for each category. So the recommended tests, for instance, for uh, the antiphospholipid antibody condition being suspected uh, or for thyroid abnormalities or for uterine abnormalities uh, are really uh, something that we will talk about a lot. The antiphospholipid antibodies, of course, we have the option of low-dose aspirin and a prophylactic dose of heparin. For thyroid abnormalities um, would be levothyroxine. But what I will emphasize is uterine abnormalities, which uh, according to the guidelines is best done on 3D ultrasound. And the effect of surgery is insufficient in these situations. Then there are tests that may be considered for explanatory purposes or in a research contest. And these include genetic testing, including information on uh, a pre-implantation genetic testing, the immunological tests, uh, HLA to ANA, sperm DNA fragmentation tests, uh, which will be followed by lifestyle advice for men, and a screen for the, uh, the hereditary thrombophilias. The non-recommended tests include other immunological tests and metabolic or hormonal tests. And really speaking, overriding all of these is the need for lifestyle advice, a lot of tender loving care, and prophylactic vitamin D, because we all seem to be deficient in it in the reproductive population. So with that background, let me highlight what ultrasound can do and where it can take you. And then of course, we will discuss a lot of these things in the panel discussion. Remember that when it comes to the ART group, we must understand that the approach has to be a little different. The higher chances in those situations are the antithyroid antibodies and fibroids. And uh, we do understand that altering those in the patient's environment can have uh, a, a more profound effect. And so we must fast track those when necessary. Now, the other interesting things in the ART group, and I'll finish that group first, is that many researchers have reported that there is a strong association between the thickness of the endometrium and pregnancy outcomes. Uh, pregnancy loss rates increase with each millimeter decline in fresh cycles when endometrial thickness is below eight millimeters and live birth rates decline as the endometrial thickness decreases below seven millimeters in frozen embryo transfer cycles. There is no significant change when the endometrial thickness is above eight millimeters. Studies that measure uh, on the trigger day indicate a threshold of about 10 millimeters for pregnancy loss. And studies done on the day of progesterone supplementation suggest a threshold of eight millimeters. So really seven, eight, nine or more is what we want. And so if the endometrium does not thicken from the linear endometrium of just postmenstrual to a thin triple layer, to a thick triple layer, to finally a secretory endometrium, that could mean trouble and result not just in failure of implantation, but loss rates uh, of pregnancy as well. The other thing that we often see and seems to be being done by everybody is endometrial volume and vascularization for pregnancy loss. It does have an impact on implantation rates, but on pregnancy loss, no. So if you're not looking at an implantation problem, then endometrial volume and vascularization on 2D and 3D don't seem to make any sense and are not recommended. The next is the presence of intrauterine adhesions, what we used to call Sinechi earlier. And we know that the plasma cell infiltrate that is associated with chronic endometritis uh, can have an associated range of pathogenic organisms. And there seem to be a lot of papers connecting more or less the same organisms again and again. But there is no doubt that yes, the presence of simple adhesions such as uh, these odd ones might interfere with an IVF, but when you see a coronal amputation or you see obliteration of the cavity, your advice has to go in a different direction. Then of course, there's the question of whether antibiotics are found to remove the endometritis, and that does not seem to have enough of evidence. Therefore, when we come to intrauterine adhesions, it does not mean that every one of these should be removed in case of two pregnancy losses. No, we really need to put everything in perspective. The next thing which we have not been aware of on ultrasound is in the infertility population, 
if you find these macro cysts in an otherwise echogenic endometrium in the so-called later delayed cycles, then they result in implantation, but they do also result in a lot more recurrent pregnancy losses. Therefore, it seems worth it in these patients to watch that endometrium and see whether we can wash it out uh, with either um, a, a, a bleeding after, uh, after withdrawal or uh, even a surgical uh, curettage before we try and do anything about that endometrium if a withdrawal bleeding doesn't work. So that, of course, is the group very specific to the ART losses. And uh, the aim really then should be for all of us to try and obtain a nice secretory endometrium without those cystic spaces and without a diffuse homogeneity. We must have the background of the triple layer with those echogenicities within superimposed on that triple layer for recurrent pregnancy losses and not to occur. The next big thing is the genetic analysis of the abortus. Now, we do know that you have structural abnormalities and non-structural abnormalities, but we also understand that um, a lot of abnormal embryos will result in losses and we need to figure these out to find out. The kind of genetic investigation that we've done in this situation has evolved. There used to be the old fashioned one where we used to do just a karyotype. And then we said, no, 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 that's not good enough. We should do a, a low end micro array, uh, not the 750 that we normally use for our amniocentesis. And then data seemed to have evolved and we moved on to sequencing. And we realized that a high pass exome sequencing that uh, is like 150X or greater and yields at least 10 GB of data and maybe up to 18 to 20 GB is perhaps the answer to find out whether these embryos are going to be recurrent or not and whether then we need to pass on to some other form of reproduction such as third party reproduction or a pre-implantation uh, genetic uh, testing. And so let me show you a few of these examples. For instance, we know that this is a normal embryo and we do 3D reconstruction. And on 3D now we know that things become a lot easier. You turn one button, which gives us a silhouette and we see, okay, this fetus has a nice normal ventricular system. On the other hand, even if an embryo is dead, we need to look at it and look at this one. It doesn't look like a normal embryo. And when I focus it a little more closely, I figure out that the cord insertion is here, which means that this is the tail end and this narrow portion is the head end. And I do a 3D reconstruction to reproduce exactly that. The cord is now here. So this wider portion is the tail end and this narrow portion is the head end and that's not a normal head proportion. And this turns out to be the one of the more common causes of recurrent pregnancy losses, which is a genetic acrania. And therefore, even when we discover a dead embryo, it's worth looking uh, for morphology and trying to see whether we will truly benefit from a genetic testing and therefore which genetic testing we should be doing. And it certainly should not be a low end microarray or a karyotype. It should be the kind of uh, exome that I suggested. Moving on from that point, when we look at other genetic abnormalities, uh, apart from the acranias, and here is another one, when we look at the acrania moving on to the exencephaly, where half the brain is gone and half is left behind, that again is genetic evaluation because that has a higher incidence of genetic abnormalities. And then of course, it's not just the CNS abnormalities, but other ones as well. And so for this particular ART, embryo which we were following up because we knew it didn't look normal, it went into a pregnancy loss after nine days. But we already had information here. So we could, at this stage of a 19 millimeter embryo, which is about <clears throat> nine weeks, we saw an ectopia cordis. We saw cord insertion here below this bump coming out from the, th from the anterior wall. So that was obviously an early gastroschisis. And we could hardly see any wall below the cord insertion, meaning that there must be a far larger anterior abdominal wall defect, such as an extrafeed bladder associated with the gastroschisis. Uh, 
So obviously this is a situation where we would then again think in terms of a genetic analysis, provided we have a dialogue with a geneticist that look, this is what I have found, please do an exome sequencing, do take parental samples that we might need to use later, but let's start at least with an embryo exome sequencing. Or this one, which is conjoined twin with one hydropic, one not hydropic, and therefore in this situation, again, because of the presence of high drops, one would consider a genetic evaluation as well. It's not routine therefore, but we must understand that yes, uh, we have to do this correctly. Uh, when these recommendations came out before uh, sequencing was available of the current standard, and array CGHS was recommended uh, basically um, uh, for, for doing it even then because the emphasis was strong. And then uh, there was the question of karyotyping or not. And it was said, no, karyotyping is, is okay. But more than that, we need a uh, array CGH at least. And then we moved on to the exome sequencing. The next question is, do we need a parental karyotype? And it's not recommended in couples with uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, but it's conditional to the fact on what you will find in the embryonic testing. In that situation, you would go on to parental genetic testing, or of course, in case there was a pointer in that particular uh, family history. We do understand that out of all the miscarriages that take place, 30 to 50% are due to cytogenetic reasons, and 2% to 4% are parental balanced structural chromosomal uh, rearrangement, um, sometimes Robertsonian translocation. So if if the exome doesn't show anything in that case, then we need a formal karyotype to try and figure out what is actually going on. Otherwise, really, uh, one can go on with what we need to see, like I have already explained. Now, the next situation is that information provision for this is going to be helpful to couples or not. And we do understand that it will help them to decide whether they should continue to try to conceive, to stop trying, choose invasive testing like a prenatal diagnosis or choose uh, a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis such as a PGT uh, SR in case of a balanced translocation. And even if you don't find anything at the end of it, the reassurance helps the couple to carry on in their next pregnancy. The next big chunk is the anatomical uterine evaluation. And in this group, it's clearly suggested by the ASHRAE guidelines that an ultrasound should be done. Ideally, it should be done even at the time of the miscarriage, but definitely after the miscarriage and after she's had one period. The preferred technique that is recommended in the guidelines is a transvaginal 3D ultrasound scan. And it is clearly known to have a high sensitivity and specificity, especially because it will differentiate between a septic uterus and the bicorporeal uterus. The bicorporeal, uh, the bicorporeal uterus, as you know, is the former uh, American Fertility Society biconuate uterus because the septate uterus is associated with miscarriages and the bicorporeal, uh, bicorporeal uterus is not associated with, with miscarriages and therefore uh, it's the right thing to do. The, uh, the instilling of saline or any contrasting material into the uterine cavity, so no hysterography, is more accurate than a hysterosalpingogram uh, in diagnosing uterine malformations, but it can be used to evaluate uterine morphology when 3D ultrasound is not available or when you have a doubt about tubal patency. Otherwise, 3D ultrasound by itself is the investigation of choice. And of course, when you do that, it's advised to look at the urinary tract as well because a missing kidney on one or the opposite side might be there. MRI is not recommended as the first line option and can be used either where 3D ultrasound is not available or if it is not conclusive. So really speaking, a 3D transvaginal ultrasound for everybody with a recurrent pregnancy loss. Remember that of all the abnormalities, really speaking, the bicorporeal uterus is not a cause of miscarriages except when you have a bicorporeal septic uterus. Notice the brown portion here in this third type of bicorporeal uterus, the class U3C type, compared to a clean two horns here without that white brown portion. 
This is where you might consider a surgical option in a bicorporeal uterus when it is a bicorporeal septate uterus. Otherwise, what most of these patients would benefit from is a, uh, is a uh, septal resection. The T-shaped uterus we shall also discuss as we go along. And let me just go through these slides to show you what is there. Remember that for all of these, we will use the new ESHRAE uh, classification or the old one where the arcuate uterus is out and is now either septate or normal. And we measure the actual septum only in comparison to the myometrial thickness and not by itself. The didelphis is now a complete septate uterus and therefore could benefit from surgery. The biconuate is now called bicorporeal. The uniconuate is now called a hemiuterus. The bicorporeal septate is new and the T-shaped is now dysmorphic. So these are things that we must remember are now interchangeable words that we should be able to be familiar with. We also know that with 2D, even if you see two cavities, you never know whether you're going to turn out to be a septate uterus or a bicorporeal, and therefore you need a 3D. So when you do demonstrate a septum, you know that some of these will carry on with the pregnancy. The question is, which ones will not? And if she's had one loss, what do we do? Well, you look at the length of the residual cavity, which is the green line C in this one, compared to the yellow, which is the length of the septum. And if you find that the residual cavity is shorter than the length of the septum, that septum needs to go even before you reach the classical definition of a recurrent pregnancy loss. If you find on day 10 of a cycle that the septum is vascular, that again is an indication for a section of that septum. Day 10, because menstrual septums are vascular, mid-cycle septums are vascular, but day 10, uh, day 10 septums are supposed to be avascular. That vascular septum on day 10 is an indicator that that vascularity will act as a pacemaker and throw out the entire conceptus later on during the pregnancy within week six and nine. Therefore, vascular septums should be attended to surgically sooner rather than later. And then, of course, you also have endometrial volume, so it's less than about uh, one to two ml. That would benefit. So really speaking, we must look out for the length of the residual cavity, the endometrial volume, and whether there is a vascular septum, as you see where my arrow is at the moment. Then we move on to defining that septum. We don't use total length, no. What we do is to find out, we put, make an orange line between the intercornual areas. The orange is the length of the sept. The orange is the myometrial thickness. The yellow is the length of the septum. And we find out whether the yellow bit is more than half the orange bit. So is the septum more than 50% of the wall thickness? And if it is, then this patient would benefit sooner than later from a resection of that particular septum. Then, of course, uh, you realize that there can be a lot of variations and each one of them, the calculation would remain the same, that you would compare the length of the septum, the yellow line, and see whether it is more than half of the vertical orange line drawn from that red line, which is an interconvert line. The uterus didelphis is now considered a complete separate uterus and has to be approached in exactly the same way. And of course, it's important to then look whether you have a septate cervix or not. The bicorporeal, like I was pointing out, has two horns, but a bit of septum in between. And again, you could consider whether that might be the cause of the recurrent pregnancy loss. Now, there's a lot of new tools in ultrasound that help you to do this, and all of them are in 3D, and they enhance the visualization of outlines. One, of course, is that we now use the new uh, the new rendering mode, or it's not so new anymore, it's five, seven years old, uh, called HD Live. In addition, for the outlines, we use a silhouette mode, which gives you outlines far better, and therefore a much clearer definition of how extensive is a septum. You can also find yourself being able to demonstrate that this inhomogeneity on 2D is very clearly seen on 3D, and this is a bunch of fibroids uh, located within a septum. And actually speaking, two of these turned out to be fibroids and one of them turned out to be an adenomyoma. That doesn't matter. All, all of them would have interfered and been the cause of recurrent losses in this case. 
And therefore, she got pregnant and carried on immediately after surgery. And like I said, we must try every trick in the book to try and find out to demonstrate this pathology so we can choose our surgery correctly. The hemi uterus or the uniconduit uterus results in late pregnancy losses and not in early pregnancy losses and therefore is not something that should alarm us at this stage. The T-shaped uterus is now called the dysmorphic where the vertical extent is not as much as the horizontal extent, but this results in implantation failures and not in pregnancy losses and therefore is not something that needs surgical attention in a patient with recurrent pregnancy loss. Now, this is a summary of the recommendations and it's exactly what I've told you. And there is insufficient evidence uh, in favor of metroplasty in women with a bicorporeal uterus and a double cervix, um, the formerly uh, died Delphi's uterus. So in this situation, please make sure that we will not handle it, also not in the bicorporeal without a septum. If we go on to fibroids, the classical teaching is uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, which is two losses, um, or maybe three in the younger patient. Uh, we're not going to get into the definitions here, but if you have a fibroid that is not a, a cavity fibroid, but is even four centimeters or more intramural, worth thinking of removing, but all cavity fibroids must be removed before the next IVF in this particular situation, which means fibroid types zero, one, and two would need attention. And again, 3D comes to our immediate uh, rescue here because it truly tells you how much of a particular fibroid is in the wall uh, and how much of it is out into uh, the actual myometrium. And therefore you get your answers. Polyps, a straightforward no-no. Yes, uh, from an IVF point of view, you might think of removing it, but not from a recurrent pregnancy loss. And there is uh, insufficient evidence supporting hysteroscopic removal of submucous or endometrial polyps in women with recurrent pregnancy loss, um, just like that. Implantation failures, different story. Recurrent pregnancy loss, different story. Now, women with a history of second trimester pregnancy losses and, and cervical insufficiency, of course, fall in a different category. And we will discuss those uh, during the rest of our uh, discussion. So the, the great messages here are ultrasound embryo phenotypes are a guide to genetic evaluation. The role of 3D ultrasound is no longer in doubt. A balance is needed between managing implantation failures and handling pregnancy loss because there is that thinking overlap. And there's a need versus desperation consideration for third party reproduction, including gametes and surrogacy. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful talk. And every time when we see your pictures and how do you explain, it is really wonderful. It just Thank goes you. into the mind. So now I invite Dr. Reema Bhatt to carry on our further session. Dr. Reema is currently the head of fetal medicine at Amrita Institute, Faridabad. And uh, she is the national, secret national SFM secretary at present. So Dr. Reema, please carry on. Thank you so much. Uh, I would uh, not waste time and start sharing my screen. For this panel, I would uh, like to invite my co-moderator, Dr. Alok Varshne, a dynamic uh, fetal medicine specialist uh, with us. And uh, from, for, I have some wonderful panelists with me, very esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Poonam Goyal, who is uh, the chairperson of the Safe Motherhood Committee, FOXI, and uh, Governing Council Member of ICOG. We have with us Dr. Sita Ramamurthy, who is the Chairperson of the Genetic and the Fetal Committee. We have Dr. Tamkin Khan, who is the Founder Secretary of the Stillbirth Society. We have Dr. Shagun, who is the Secretary of the Telangana SFM Chapter, and she is a Professor at the Nizams Hyderabad, a very renowned clinical geneticist. And we have Dr. Charu, a professor from Ames, Jodhpur. Um, I have very illustrious panelists and a very dynamic co-moderator uh, with me. 
and Dr. Kurana has already taken us through those glamorous images, uh, which uh, definitely uh, we, we, we want to imbibe. So I would now request uh, Dr. Ashok Vashne to join in. And uh, we have we understand that rectal pregnancy loss is a big problem. There are a lot of questions okay. by the patients. Why? When? How? How can I prevent it? So we will take you through this panel to answer those questions. I um, it's, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can we have, have that, uh, that that two minutes for our trade partner presentation before we go into the panel? Yes, sir. That would, would that be, be possible? Yes. yes. So that then we have the panel continuously. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So over to admin for our trade partner presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are back and I once again extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists and uh, we definitely, Sir has taken, Sir has made the platform for us to start discussing uh, about recurrent pregnancy losses. Uh, sir has taken us through the first trimester losses. We would want to move on to late second and maybe the third trimester losses as well. So uh, Dr. Alok Vashne, I would want to request you to take us through the first case. So good evening, everyone. Good evening to all the delegates, Purana sir, Mohit sir, and all the esteemed panelists. So we have three cases covering very important aspects of recurrent pregnancy losses. And we welcome your crisp inputs on these. So the first case, she's uh, at 22 weeks of gestation, gravida three, one abortion, one birth, but uh, she had a miscarriage later on and no live births till now. And she has presented to us at 22 weeks of gestation. Uh, one pregnancy was a missed abortion at 22 weeks. One pregnancy was IUFD at 24 weeks. She was put on aspirin in that, in, uh, in that case. And now she conceived by IVF conception. She's on aspirin, 150 milligrams. Uh, so first trimester combined screening, that was normal. And normally scan was also normal, cervical length was also normal. So next slide, Dr. Rima. So uh, this is for Dr. Seem, uh, Dr. Sita Ramamurthy, ma'am. So in view of her previous two losses, how should she have been evaluated preconceptionally? And has she missed the bus now? Can we do something for her now uh, in view of her recurrent pregnancy loss? Uh, thank you for that question, Dr. Alok. And firstly, thank you, SFM, for giving me this opportunity here. And uh, thank you, Kurana, sir, for that excellent talk. So here, um, yes, I mean, especially now we know that she's had two late miscarriages and uh, we would start investigating ideally preconceptionally. So I would say, yes, she has missed the board because a lot of these investigations would make sense when done in the preconception period. And if there is something, we could work on it as we've heard a, lo a lot. So I, assuming that the two uh, pregnancy losses they she had was the congenitally, there were no congenital abnormalities, which we could ask from a brief history, because that is important as well to note. But considering that they were normal, then we'll have to look at other causes that we've seen, that we've heard from Dr. Kurana, sir, that whether there was any uh, immunological, like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, whether there was any genetic cause or whether there's any uterine cause. And most of these tests would be done, would be assessed better if they are done preconceptionally or in the, uh, uh, the preconceptional period. So um, for anatomical, we've, we've seen that we have to do a 3D ultrasound in the, in the, in the non-pregnant state. But even if you're looking for an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which means um, presence of antiphospholipid antibodies which are causing these recurrent late pregnancy losses or maybe even early pregnancy losses but mostly a uh, um, late uh, loss in the second or th third trimester or development of you know because of the abnormal placentation which causes maybe it be a primary or secondary to SLE 
you need to do these investigations ideally in the antenatal period because it needs the presence of the um, clinical marker as well as a bio, uh, you know a, a blood parameter which is done at least 12 weeks apart so as we've said that it could be a uh, you know associated with thrombotic event or an obstetric event but whatever it is we need to have the presence of three antibodies that is the lupus anticoagulant anticardiolipin antibody will do IgG IgM and anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 which has come up in a big way both IgG IgM and these have to be done twice to confirm at least 12 weeks apart. So now that she's 22 weeks pregnant and, you know, uh, uh, and assuming that uh, ultrasound in the first trimester was normal, we really don't have much to offer at this point as uh, apart from just screening her for things and, you know, look, taking it dynamically as and when it comes forward. So um, I, I would say that's where we are standing. So, yeah, so in, in, in cases of, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome many patients they present with thrombosis but in uh, such in you know, obstetric cases if there is recurrent pregnancy loss so can we uh, consider them as antiphospholipid syndrome so what is obstetric aps or apla yeah so uh, as i so there is a uh, thrombotic part of uh, aps and an obstetric part of aps which is basically not fits into the criteria where you have clinical criteria there are more uh, more unexplained consecutive miscarriages as you've put or they might be late um, uh, losses with abruption or abnormal placentation and there is uh, this um, uh, what do you say low, there are, there are not typical laboratory criteria that are met. You don't have the ACL, uh, the, uh, the lupus anticulin might be weakly positive or the ones that we look at for anticardiolipin, which has to be more than the 99% which is not there. They don't fit into the obstetric criteria. So you might sort of, you know, consider them, it, but it is not evidence-based to give them any treatment at this of now. It is an empirical form of treatment. So you have to sort of tell them, counsel them accordingly that may or it may not work. And many of you know the people don't advise any treatment. And now we have already lost because she's already now 22 weeks. So there is really no point at this stage to start off any treatment apart from monitoring her. So this topic is actually very, you know, confusing because some some patients they do not even have positive uh, serum markers. Yeah. So uh, what is zero negative uh, Dr. Sita Pan? Yeah, so um, zero negative applies again, to, as, I, uh, as I briefly mentioned, if there are cl classical criteria where the patient gives a very strong history of recurrent losses, but you do the, uh, bio, the, you know, the laboratory criteria and they are negative. Now, that is, some, that is what it basically means. And it could be related because it, it was because the, it's a very uh, lab-based criteria, lab-sensitive rather. These tests are so if the lab is not uh, adequately, uh, you know, they don't do it in the right way, or if it, the sample was not sent in the right way, uh, these things can cause a seronegative APLA. And so some um, sort of professionals believe that you know even if it is seronegative APLA, if the history, as I said again, you have to tell them that it is an empirical form of treatment. If you are, there is no evidence to say that anything will work here. So you know there is no guidelines to recommend that any treatment works here. So even if you, uh, so you have to counsel the couple accordingly that you know whatever you're giving is an empirical form of treatment and it may it may not work. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Tamkeen, uh, so what are the management protocols are we formulating here and what are the options for antithrombotic therapy? Are these straightforward treatments or are there controversies around them? Okay, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I think it's a very challenging situation in this particular case. Patient with two midterm pregnancy losses where cardiac activity was present but lost. No workup of past pregnancies. And currently, it's an IVF pregnancy. Uh, but the similar lining is that she's low risk for aneuploidy. So, vical length is 2.9 centimeters, came to us at 22 weeks with the, more than half of the pregnancy already crossed. Uh, I would like to evaluate her further with a platelet count, vitamin D levels. Tommy's recommends that, uh, a OGTT rather than a DIPC test, because that would miss fasting hyperglycemia a thyroid profile and anti-TPO, serum creatinine and urine routine microscopic. And uh, now again, the controversy comes back. Uh, what Dr. Sita already talked about, should I evaluate for uh, APLA at this uh, stage during pregnancy? 
So the criteria, as you already displayed, for all guidelines is to test twice. I can't wait for a repeat test in this particular case. Maybe if she came very early, just immediately with a UPT positive, I could have, you know, waited. But no, we, I can't wait in this particular case. So why why would I test her for APLA at this stage? If triple uh, uh, you know markers are positive or the titer is very high, so uh, more than 80, that would be, I think, very definitive for me to start uh, heparin. If she, uh, maybe she could be moderate risk between 40 to 79 or low risk when 20 to 39, when I would just think twice before starting heparin. But high titers or when all of them are positive, or when IgG is positive rather than IgM. Uh, and along with an evaluation for persistent thrombocytopenia, heart disease, uh, APLA, nephropathy, like proteinuria for, or microscopic hematuria, all these would be supportive. And after this, uh, and if I find, do not find any other cause, uh, I would uh, you know, uh, advise her uh, lifestyle modification, weight match diet, uh, smoking, both partners, according to new history guidelines, both husband and wife, their lifestyle uh, affects the uh, you know outcome of pregnancy and, of course, exercise. Uh, the triple risk model for fetal death, as we say, is related to certain maternal factors like maternal age, smoking, obesity, uh, uh, most uh, consistent correlation uh, with RPL, then fetal and placental factors like FGR, and then the genetic constitution of the of the baby itself, like subtle cardiac, uh, not, not major anomalies, but so, uh, sub, very subtle cardiac conduction defects or autonomic nervous system. We talk, when we talk about unexplained stillbirth uh, de deaths and certain, you know, uh, stressors like sleeping uh, position of the mother. So I would advise lifestyle modification along with aspirin, with the parent, uh, maybe because uh, ACOG, uh, you know, at this stage also, because ACOG, uh, uh, you know, recommends uh, uh, starting aspirin as late as 26 to 28 weeks. So on that same premise, I would uh, counsel her, discuss with her regarding the diagnostic criteria. The risk of rec uh, recurrence of this is as high as 45% with the third, uh, third pregnancy after two losses. Then the limitations of the data that is available, the pros and cons of the um, uh, starting heparin, and then it should be a shared decision making between me and the patient and with proper documentation because you know recently i i was called as an expert in a case where mm. uh, the the uh, patient was a uh, previous abortion with a ivf pregnancy and somebody had started this uh, you know uh, without uh, testing her on heparin she ultimately aborted and there was a life threatening hemorrhage and then they you know, took the patient, the doctor to court that this heparin was started unnecessarily. So do proper documentation and keeping that in mind. And also that it is her decision as well as my decision. And apart from that, I keep on monitoring with her for FGR and terminate at 39 weeks as per, you know, guidelines. With previous losses, you terminate at 13, especially second or third trimester losses. Uh, uh, muted, Dr. Muted. Dr. Muted. Yep. So thank you so much for your elaborating, to Dr. Tanki. And I, I have one question. So uh, now we will have to give heparin after taking the consent. I didn't need to be explained. I just gave an example. I, I think uh, <laughs> what, what's the, the motto here is that these drugs, we consider them as more or less safe, but they are not safe, actually. They are not. So if there's a you know indication, then we start all these medications. Can I add uh, something? It is mm. not only about being safe or unsafe. It is the way the patients start googling, you know, the side effects, mm. and then make assumptions, and then they start a whole. You know, the, finally the doctor was not uh, you know uh, not uh, implicated, but mm. that dragging through courts for almost three years, the trauma that the doctor honestly went through. So there is a lot of controversy as far as uh, heparin is concerned. And I think we still, we have to be very sure when we start heparin for our patients. Yeah. So this patient yeah. came to us, it's 24 weeks and uh, she was an aspirin. We did not start heparin and continue the pregnancy. Uh, so we thought of APLA, can we test for APLA in pregnancy? That's another question that needs to be answered. Uh, 
Dr. Tumkin, I, Dr. C. Would you want to do APLA testing? In this advanced pregnancy like this, she's already at 22, 24 weeks. I think there is no fun now doing it. Maybe at 12 weeks or something, it should be okay. Yes, so um, we've continued yeah. this pregnancy and she we, she was yeah, on aspirin, yeah. developed preeclampsia at 32 weeks and uh, we did increase surveillance. Can so I doctor, add something here? Yeah, yes, doctor. Sita. Yeah, so uh, regarding testing for APLA in pregnancy, Generally, it is not done in pregnancy because it is of no use. As we said, as Madam said, that you know, you even if uh, you if and sometimes the the maternal hormones itself can give you a bit of skewed result. Okay. But more importantly, we can't confirm it. It is because we can't wait for another twelve weeks to start <clears throat> uh, to uh, confirm the test. So uh, generally, APLA test is uh, I mean, and, um, is not done in pregnancy. And secondly, about heparin, it is it is not there is no controversy regarding it. But yes, whenever you start it, it has to have a specific indication. It has to be evidence based, and especially because if uh, these ladies are at high risk, so when they are on heparin, they may need emergency surgery, and that is when you need to counsel them. There, there are risks of bleeding if you know if they don't stop in time before there is not enough time before you go in for a surgery, especially for those cases. So all those counseling needs to be done, and if they are counseled properly and documented. I think we are all right with it, isn't it? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Sita. So, Dr. Charu, uh, do you think that we need to test for thrombophilia in cases of uh, recurrent losses? Is it indicated? It's an expensive test for the patient. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for the question. So, right now, we were talking about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is acquired thrombophilia. So now we are talking about inherited thrombophilias, which are commonly the factor V laden mutation, the prothrombin gene mutation, and the protein C and S deficiencies, antithrombin 3 deficiencies. So ideally, the ESHRI guidelines say that these tests, they are not recommended. We should not evaluate for these tests uh, unless there are some additional risk factors. Like suppose if there is some history of family uh, the venous thrombo, uh, thromboembolism history is there in the family or there is some previous history of venous thrombosis or the patient is obese, the BMI is very high, some additional risk factors are there. Uh, then, of course, we can uh, evaluate for thrombophilias, but we have to counsel the patient that even if we are evaluating, it will not improve the outcomes of the live birth rate, whether we are treating her or not treating her. It is just for prognostication, just for uh, telling her the cause if they are worried. So uh, uh, only in the, uh, that context we can evaluate for uh, uh, this inherited thrombophilias. So it's only in research context and really doesn't change the management and outcome of the patient. So uh, Dr. Poonam, uh, anything else if you if you are suspecting immunological cause, if you have an established APLA, uh, do you think there's something else that endangers the fetus and the mother yeah. other than just the risk of uh, placental insufficiency, stillbirth? There's something else that we're looking at. So, yes, with the, these conditions, uh, there are other adversities, possibility of other adversities also. Like there may be hypertensive disorders in the pregnancy, there may be preeclampsia, eclampsia, there may be thrombosis. The antibodies actually, they disrupt the placenta and uh, the blood flow to the fetus is hampered because of the small thrombi in the placental tissue. So this all can lead to finally the FGR, oligohydramnios, fetal distress, then preterm labor, which may be hydrogenic or may be as such also. And finally, there may be possibility of fetal loss also. And uh, it can very well lead to HELP syndrome also. HELP is like there is a triad of uh, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and then low platelet. And though HELP is rare, but still it is, if it happens, it's very catastrophic. And uh, we, so we need to keep in mind that these patients may go into this and a timely diagnosis will help in these particular patients. Otherwise, our patient may go into liver failure, kidney failure, DIC, and finally, there may be maternal loss also in these particular patients. So, we have to be very careful and make so, our diagnosis. Yes. So we, we have, have to, to be very thoughtful. Like you, and said in your patient, like you said in your patient, uh, patient went into eclampsia, you <laughs> were just telling, no? Yes. 
so i increase fetal and maternal surveillance so for our patient developed preeclampsia had uterocrystal yeah. insufficiency went into fgr and deserved an early delivery at about well, surveillance is very important so and early surveillance detection surveillance is extremely extremely important so uh, dr sita would you would you want to treat uh, thrombophilia with if it's a confirmed thrombophilia with heparin maybe because of factor 5 latent mutation or protein s deficiency c deficiency would you want to treat with heparin you're muted dr sita sorry yeah. yeah so firstly if there is no history of thrombosis in personal in a, a, a personal history of thrombosis i wouldn't actually screen for inherited thrombophilia just for recurrent miscarriage so that we that is clear but if we have tested it uh, because of the thrombosis history, the thrombosis history will give you an indication of starting her on therapeutic anticoagulation rather than the history of recurrent losses. So the entire story goes that way because we're not here to prove, we're not here to improve her outcome because of the inherited thrombophilia, which has no role in the recurrent miscarriages. It is because of to prevent uh, further thrombosis if she's had one. And right. that is why you will have therapeutic anticoagulation then. Yes, so that solves uh, that we really don't need to test for thrombophilia too aggressively and that heparin is out because the recent study randomized trial, this was possible, the first randomized trial where they uh, did uh, use heparin for thrombophilia and they found that they did not improve the life birth rates in pregnancies with heparin. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Sita. Mm -hmm. So uh, we go on to our second case. This is this 32-year-old lady, G4 with three abortions. There was first abortion at 14 weeks. Second was an MTP at 20 weeks due to fetus with multiple malformations. The third was a spontaneous abortion at 10 weeks. And this was a current pregnancy. She came to us for the first time at 32 weeks, two days with early onset growth restriction. So she was in regular antenatal checkup elsewhere. NT scan was normal. Biochemistry was not done. She had an anomaly scan which showed an ecogenic intracardiac focus right kidney dilatation of 8 millimeters, facial profile was suggestive of micrognathia, single umbilical artery, and there was no major structural abnormality. The Dopplers, when she came to us, were normal. So, uh, Dr. Shagun, I would want to ask you that is there, now we have early onset FGR, some ultrasound abnormalities which are mild, and we also have a previous history of recurrent uh, abortions. Would you suggest a and an invasive testing at this point of time, do we need to evaluate this baby? I mean, uh, again, uh, of course, yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, so from the point of trying to establish an etiology, definitely this case does require a uh, genetic workup. Also, like as you mentioned, the previous pregnancy, one with multiple anomalies, two first trimester losses, and now this baby having some subtle findings, uh, on the scan, also an early onset FGR is setting in normal Dopplers. Okay, so all these are pointing uh, towards that a possible genetic etiology does exist. But then, of course, one point, you know, we need to balance out the fact that now she's already 32 weeks. And at this gestation, doing an invasive testing, uh, what are we achieving? So uh, we would have to kind of, of course, from a geneticist's point of view, I would like to find out what is going on here. But uh, we need to balance it with the patient, uh, take again, uh, you know, a discussion with the patient uh, considering the advanced gestation, what impact would this testing really have on in terms of taking a decision for her? Uh, because uh, moving forward, even if the genetic testing does show anything, um, of course, I mean, uh, termination at this gestation, all those things, of course, there are uh, now we know the, I mean, the law and all those things there are. Uh, I mean, those things or avenues also available. But I would say the more important thing probably would be at such gestation to still offer genetic testing could be a kind of management of the intrapartum period. Because if really we are able to show that this baby is having a genetic abnormality, then your intrapartum decision making, suppose tomorrow she lands up in a fetal distress so I would not really want to do a section for her at this particular point of time. And of course, in the neonatal period also, I would be prepared, you know, uh, for how much I want to resuscitate a baby, whether, you know, I take a baby to the NICU for a, a scenario where already a genetic diagnosis has been made. So it would help more 
I would say at this gestation, uh, in preparing the couple, in deciding our intrapartum management and the immediate neonatal management, in case there is something which uh, abnormal, which turns out on genetic testing. So, but all these things would need to be again, you know, it has to be an informed and uh, shared decision making because it's not something straightforward. So all these points have to be discussed with the patient and then these decisions have to be taken. But yes, I definitely, for me, I mean, this is looking like a scenario where there is a possible genetic etiology. So this is my one of my old cases, the times when we did karyotyping, which we don't do currently, we only offer microarray. We did amniocentesis, kept the fetus under surveillance. And uh, why? Because it was a breach. We didn't want to do a cesarean if there was some chromosomal abnormality. And to our surprise, we it was trisomy uh, 9 that turned out very rare. And we know that the prognosis of the baby is not good in these cases. And we did, uh, she had an IUD at 34 weeks and we did a normal <coughs> delivery. So I, uh, and then of course the pair, uh, autopsy was suggested and parents denied. And ultrasound, there was also ambiguous genitalia with single umbilical artery. So uh, my uh, point was that because of this genetic testing, we could avoid cesarean section in a lady and yes. not scar her for the baby. Yes. But yes. Uh, of course, uh, the parents had normal chromosomes. So this wasn't a balanced translocation. So I just wanted you to so highlight. I would not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, you know, I would not jump straight away to say that this is balanced. Uh, because what happens is that uh, a karyotype's resolution is only till a certain level. So only if we have a translocation or is any other balanced uh, rearrangement, uh, which is a certain size and it can be seen under the microscope uh, while doing a karyotype, then only it will get picked up. But we know that there are couples who have these cryptic balanced rearrangements, which are too tiny to be seen on a karyotype. So it, they may look apparently balanced, but they will not be balanced. So like at this, like for this particular case, now, yes, the uh, karyotype did show chrome, I mean, trisomy 9. But given the history of this particular family, I would be very strongly suspecting that there is a balanced, uh, I mean, some kind of a balanced cryptic rearrangement involving that chromosome 9 in one of the parent that's probably causing those recurrent uh, previous losses. And here also something uh, similar has happened we are not just able to see it on karyotype so ideally of course as you said this is an older case so but then we would have wanted to do a microarray for the baby uh, that being said uh, there is sometimes a misconception where uh, the microarray of the parents gets done so this i want to clarify that you know microarray is uh, something which will only tell us in unbalanced things so if there is some dna missing some dna extra that will come up in a microarray. But uh, so if we do a fetus microarray, we'll if there is something there, we'll find it. But if you end up doing now for this couple, like, you know, suppose like you said, karyotype of the parents was normal. And then maybe, you know, there could be a thought where that let's do a microarray of the parents. Maybe we'll find it. So nothing is going to come up there. Even if they have those rearrangements, because they are balanced, a microarray is not going to pick those things up. So that is one important thing. There is hardly ever any indication of doing a microarray of parents in case of a recurrent pregnancy loss. The microarray has to be done for the fetus or the uh, POC as be the situation. So that is one important thing. So um, I think you had shown one slide where and Kurana sir had also mentioned. So uh, whereby like basically this figure of um, RPL. So again, uh, there is one more important thing to realize, you know, if you read uh, literature, then you'll find that 50% uh, of uh, um, pregnancy losses or miscarriages are having a chromosomal abnormalities. And then you see this figure, 2 to 4% of RPL is chromosomal abnormality. These are such diverse figures. So we need to just remember the very important thing that, yes, if we do a, a genetic testing for a single miscarriage, 50% of them are going to turn out to be aneuploid. But that doesn't mean that this is the cause of the recurrence. So the recurrence due to chromosomal abnormality will happen only if one of the parent has a balanced rearrangement, usually a translocation, sometimes an inversion and all. And this is true for only 2 to 4% couples. So um, that's why 
although yes the ashray and other guidelines do mention nowadays that do a microarray of the poc but actually as geneticists we don't recommend it so you may do a poc microarray sometimes the parent a patient really wants a closure kind of thing you know what has happened kind of thing that may be a reason to do it but if you are looking at a family with an rpa then do a parental karyotype that is where your answer will lie and not in your poc microarray poc microarray may show you you know trisomy 9 monosomy so monosomy this that that doesn't give you the answer of the rpl so answer of rpl will be found in the parents karyotype and not in the poc microarray yes that being said but we do do psc microarrays one as i mentioned for closure second we can do it for suppose we have done everything all the investigations are done acquired etiologies are ruled out parents chromosomes are looking normal then still patient is having our recurrent miscarriages then we would do a chromosomal microarray of the poc uh, to find out so those will be the cases where those cryptic things will show up and those com comprise of some 2% of cases where everything is normal rpl still recurrent miscarriages are happening then if you do a micro poc you will find it and uh, this again is true actually more for the first trimester losses so all these things are true actually for first trimester losses but if there is any loss happening beyond 12 weeks without an obvious obstetric reason so you don't you have ruled out cervical incompetency you have ruled out uterine placental insufficiency And these are the two main things, and you've ruled out APLA and everything. And still, patient has a second pregnant. I mean, a second trimester onwards, second trimester, third trimester, any time a pregnancy loss. Then, in that case, we investigate. Even one loss is sufficient for us to investigate, and we recommend their investigation of the fetus. And uh, this would not really be only a microarray directly. It would be a first an autopsy. so first an autopsy any loss even single loss unexplained loss beyond 12 weeks requires a fetal autopsy for phenotyping for finding out what is the abnormality in the baby and then we should go ahead and do a microarray or rarely an exome sequencing in certain scenarios depending on your autopsy findings so uh, i mean it's not like you know uh, uh, i mean very uh, i mean simple in that sense it is also sometimes case to case but broadly speaking first trimester losses require a parental karyotype and second trimester onwards unexplained losses require a fetal autopsy followed by a fetal genetic workup so there is a difference in this and second trimester first trimester losses mostly you will find uh, chromosomal abnormalities more commonly second trimester onwards both chromosomal and single gene disorders contribute so there onwards there is also a role of doing exome sequencing so uh, so it is like very much dependent i mean uh, the etiology is a little bit different for early losses later losses and the workup also is somewhat different Doctor Shagun, uh, normally what happens is that with good ultrasound, in, in good ultrasound available now, uh, and we most of the findings are picked up on ultrasound after twelve weeks. So, and the patient uh, does not want to get an autopsy done. There are financial implications as well. So, would you suggest that we could go ahead with whole exome if we know the ultrasound findings? But, but you would definitely insist on an autopsy like before the whole exome. I mean that. So we the... would insist on an autopsy. So an autopsy is known to. I mean, there are multiple, multiple, you know, uh, published literature, and uh, we have also done sub uh, substantial work. Mm -hmm. So around this fifteen to somewhere around thirty percent of uh, abnormalities are missed in scan. I'm not talking here about uh, you know major abnormalities or even. I'm sure, like of course, everybody is an expert here uh, in SFM. So we, nowadays, of course, all these micrognathia and so many other things are also picking, getting picked up with good scan, good expertise, and all. But there would still be an element of dysmorphism which remains, which cannot be picked up still by ultrasound, and some some other abnormalities, some gut anomalies, and certain things are not so easy to pick up on scan, even in best of hands. Right. So, an autopsy right. is the gold it's standard, standard actually. Yeah. So, yes, the case so autopsy, yeah. the autopsy gives a perspective on what is actually wrong with the baby. Yeah, yeah, Correct. and that that helps us decide also which test this Big case test. needs. 
Great. And sometimes we may do directly an exome and we don't even, uh, you know, want to waste any time or money doing a microarray. So that autopsy actually gives us a lot of information. But as you know, Dr. Rima, as you said, I know it's a sensitive thing. Sometimes, you know, some parents don't want their baby to be, you know, uh, cut open and all those things. And there are financial issues. Sometimes in private sector, there are also legal uh, issues and things. And in fact, our, our center, we are government hospital, but for, and we are doing autopsies for more than 12 years. But it has happened with us that parents have taken the baby back for cremation and thrown it, you know literally thrown it in a park or somewhere and those a lot of things happen I mean no so these are tricky situations yes so if suppose autopsy is not possible na, at least we should take photographs of the baby do x-rays of the baby take some tissue of the baby bank the DNA so at least some minimal uh, documentation of the post uh, you know birth phenotype should be done Thank you. Thank you for this takeaway. And we have also found in our uh, in our cases that most common aberrations were structural rearrangements in recurrent pregnancy losses. Uh, and but uh, okay, so I will not touch upon this. We've had a good discussion. So this is a controversial issue that they now say that uh, a meta analysis that we may not require to do uh, parental karyotyping and products of conception should actually be sent for uh, the testing. So I think it's hugely controversial. What we go take away today is that we before 12 weeks, the POC, and after 12 weeks, autopsy followed by whole exome or microarray, whatever is deemed essential. So I would request uh, Dr. Alok to take us through the next case. So uh, she's a 28 years woman and uh, gravida for two abortions. Uh, she's at 12 weeks of gestation now. First was a missed abortion at eight weeks for which she underwent suction and evacuation. The second pregnancy was a preterm onset of painless labor at 25 weeks of gestation. And uh, that baby did not survive. And third pregnancy also suffered a similar fate. That was a painless abortion in 22 weeks. And now it's a current pregnancy which has been uneventful till now. NT scan is normal, but it is the cervical length which is 1.9 centimeter. So we know cervical incompetence is a very, very important uh, cause of recurrent pregnancy loss. But uh, Dr. Poonam, can, how do we screen for cervical incompetence and so, when do we screen for it? So normally uh, we do the cervical screening that is done. The We measure the length of the cervix so that there is a one particular criteria for doing that. It is to be done in, uh, by transvaginal ultrasound and 50 to 70 percent of the image should be occupied by the cervix only and the examination should be done for three to five minutes because uh, cervix is a dynamic uh, structure and sometimes it looks normal but in a minute it will give away with the pressure or with fetal movement or with uterine contraction so we need to look for three to five minutes then we should take at least three measurements for the cervical length and the shortest is to be considered and the main thing is that a bladder should be empty at that time and the measurement should be done from internal loss to external loss. We need to rule out that we are not including the decidua in huh? that uh, uh, which whichever thing we are measuring. So to identify sometimes internal loss is little tricky. So you have to just move your probe here and there and finally you will find. So you have to measure from os to os. So uh, then we divide the patient into two categories. One is high risk patients and the other is a routine patient or the low risk patient. High risk are those who are ha who have the history of preterm lab labor or preterm delivery in their earlier pregnancies or there is history of uh, fetal loss. Uh, at uh, 16 weeks uh, or more than 16 weeks gestation which is kind of a painless or may not be painless still more than 16 weeks gestation there is history of some cervical surgery there is history of uh, multiple dnc's there is history of uterine anomalies uh, or there is uh, uh, multiple pregnancies in those particular patients we uh, first do the screening at 14 to 16 weeks of gestation 
or if not possible, again, patient cannot come at 14 weeks, then we can include it in our anti scan and do at that time at 13 weeks or so. And then call the patient at two to three weeks, we need to repeat the uh, see the cervical length. And if the patient is at low risk, then obviously we can do it at 18 to 22 weeks. We can include it in our level two scan. And but the method of doing is the crux of the thing. Very right. So uh, one way to identify internal loss is that we can you know identify the cervical mucosa. Yes. Trace it. You can follow the mucosa. mucosa. Very so yes. that way you yes. exclude the cervical lips, and yes. you can find the true internal loss. And then your U shape, V shape, all these yes. things they don't matter. And yes. if you see the amniotic fluid. And debris in that you may rule out infection, but that is not related with the incompetence. Okay, so uh, so next slide, Doctor Zima. Uh, next, this is this has been discussed. So, what are the treatment strategies to prevent preterm? And this is for Doctor Sita. Um. So basically. Any woman who's had a history of preterm, that itself is a very big, the biggest risk factor for this person. So the treatment strategies to prevent preterm as such are very, you know, though we can only predict the preventive measures are there, but they're not very foolproof. But it all starts with, uh, you know, lifestyle modification, as we can say that, you know, to, uh, if she's uh, obese, if she's diabetic and all to control her diabetes and if she can... Um, um, she can reduce her weight and the role of other things are all debatable. We are not very sure about whether um, they will actually work. Now, once you have had a previous history of preterm birth, the, we start, the minute the lady comes to your clinic, you sort of, they usually, the recommendation is to give them, you know, as of now, they actually also recommends that vaginal progesterone, you can start off with them. That works best. And then you start, along with that, simultaneously, you start screening for the cervical length as well. Though even the ISOOG recommends screening starts from around 18 weeks, but in patients, you know, you have had had previous history of preterm births, you would, though, in each, though ideally first trimester is not the time when we look for cervical length and predict the risk of preterm by looking at the cervical length. But in this case, the cervical length is 1.9. And maybe, you know, if she's already on progesterone, we, if she's not, you could start her on progesterone. But she's already on progesterone. You could give her, you know, you can maybe no need to admit her, but give her some sort of a low uh, activity at home and rescan her again at 14 weeks. And it's still the same. Then maybe put in a cervical surclass because according to his work, the, the cutoff is around one or 1.5 as normally we would say to put in a surclass. So along with progesterones, you could give her uh, a surclass if the cervix is going below 1.5 centimeter. Right. Thank you so I would much. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sita that uh, are we um, waiting till 15 in clinical practice? That is what I 15, uh, 15 no, so mm. And they are even saying 10 mm to put the stitch. So 15 is so, so if you see 2.5 is a cutoff for with the short cervix, uh -huh. but she's already on progesterone and then you are serially measuring the cervix every one to two weeks to see. And then if you're going to add another prophylactic measure, then your cutoff will become 1.5 or less to put in a cerclage. That is what is the recommendation. Even if SUOC 2022 recommends the same. Can I just uh, add something? Yes, madam. Yes, yes. This particular patient, uh, if you're talking about this particular patient, she's one uh, abortion followed by suction evacuation with uh -huh. very typical history of cervical incompetence. So she has to have, like, circulage should be the first line of treatment for us. We'll not wait for the for the cervix to dilate or the cervix to shorten Absolutely. and then. Because yeah. for this particular patient, she needs a circulage. Painless abortion, cervix is already 2.4. Already it's less, so we wouldn't yeah. wait. Yeah. And the um, the abortions are happening in progressively lesser gestational ages. Mm. Uh, first was eight weeks, then it was 20, uh, 25. Two 22, no? And then, uh, 20, uh, yeah, second was 25 weeks. Mm. Eight weeks, 25 weeks, and then now she's 12 weeks right now. This is the third time she's coming. And at 1.9. And suction evacuation followed by a painless abortion. 
There's one more, one more delivery that happened more, at around yeah, 22. One more happened at 22 weeks, I think. 22 right? weeks. Yeah. So, very so classical kind of... case where you wouldn't, uh, yeah. even if you can progesterone is going very yeah. less, so you would, uh, you know, recommend uh -huh. the circlage. Yes. Yeah. And definitely a, a, an abdominal surclutch preconceptionally would also have been a good idea for this kind of mm. a case. Would yes, yes. Work to well. So, uh, Dr. Tumkin, role of progesterone in reference pregnancy loss in the absence of shortening of cervical length. What would you suggest? Okay, in the absence. Okay. Of shortening. So, uh, again, yeah, the ESHRI guidelines 2022 data from the PROMISE trial uh, supported against vaginal use of vaginal progesterone, but then later on additional data from the PRISM and a meta-analysis of both these trials together. Uh, now they have recommended on that basis that when there's more than three losses and there's a vaginal bleeding in the current pregnancy, you start vaginal progesterone or RCOG recommends a, a, even with one loss. One loss and bleeding in the current pregnancy. Uh, you need to start uh, uh, vaginal progesterone. Thank you. So they've been confusing us a lot with this promised trial uh, against. And then now they say that if there are three or more losses with bleeding in the current pregnancy, progesterone yes. in the dose of 400 microgram is suggested thank you so much and dr tumkin one one meta analysis of you know 11 studies published in 2023 <laughs> for ajog uh, they combined uh, they wanted to see the outcome of circlage combined with progesterone so the outcome was in terms of gestational age birth weight and decreased neonatal morbidity and mor morbidity was in support of adding progesterone even with a circlage oh thank you thank you for that input dr tumkin so uh, a very uh, quick question, and now we'll go to through rapid fire question because time is a little short. So Dr. Charu, any role of treating infection in current rectal pregnancy loss? Do you think we need to treat infections? I mean, infections, they will uh, not cause recurrent pregnancy losses. However, if any infection is there which is causing any bacteremia or viremia that has to be treated, if there is high-grade fever that has to be treated, if there is malaria, it has to be treated. But uh, there is no such genital infection which will remain in the uh, genitalia and the patient will remain asymptomatic and only will present with a recurrent pregnancy loss. So infections, they are not uh, uh, responsible for the recurrent pregnancy loss. However, if uh, there is an infection currently, then that, that has to be treated. So there is no role of for treating uh, this torch infections because they are not responsible for recurrent pregnancy losses. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Charu. So we don't treat infections in uh, for recurrent pregnancy losses. That has to be uh, registered with all of us. But there is this a randomized, uh, prospective, multi-centric, randomized, double-blind study that has been launched now, uh, the CERM study, with blames chronic endometritis for recurrent miscarriage. And they are trying whether doxycycline in the, for 14 days in recurrent miscarriage could improve outcomes but this has just been launched as far as we are concerned currently there is no treatment for infections that is needed so, uh, dr Poon, yeah uh, yes yeah. dr uh, alok yeah dr poonam is there any role of ivig in recurrent pregnancy loss sir as such uh, we cannot say there is role the uh, which the guidelines Dr. Purana was mentioning in ASHRAE guidelines 2017 also they have said that there is no role currently of IVIG and the USFDA uh, that recommends IVIG use in eight conditions and RPL is not one of them. But of late in 2022, 22, there have been studies. One big study was from China also in 2022. They all are recommended recommending IVIG. I mean, they are giving positive results with IVIG that the uh, take-home baby rate is more with the use of IV, IVIG or live pregnancy, live birth rate is more. But still, there is a long controversy. I think very desperate situations, you have four or five unexplained abortions and nothing uh, you are getting. And your patient, you have counseled the patient and everything is in black and white with the patient. In those particular cases, you can try IVIG. The dose is 0.4 milligram 
पर के जी वो पॉइंट फोर ग्राम पर के जी बॉडी वेट दैट इज फोर हंड्रेड मिलीग्राम पर के जी बॉडी वेट एंड द कॉस्ट इज वेरी हाई टेन ग्राम आई थिंक कम्स ऑफ अराउंड एटीन थाउजेंड समथिंग एंड फॉर अ पेशेंट ऑफ फिफ्टी के जी यू कैन सी यू विल नीड एटलीस्ट टू बॉटल ऑफ दैट एंड देर आर टू काइंड ऑफ रिकमेंडेशन वन पीपल से दैट i mean there are two types of studies one they have done that when they have identified the pregnancy intrauterine then they are giving it from 5 to 6 6 or 7 weeks they are saying 4 to 6 weeks uh, after demonstrating a intrauterine pregnancy continuously five doses and the other group has given uh, this uh, this much amount that is 400 mg every Three weeks or one month, three to four weeks, and then it is to be given till thirty-two weeks of pregnancy. But they are showing positive result. But I would say, still in very desperate situation, your patient understands and they can afford, and they can give you in writing this. The yes, we want to. We are okay with this treatment. Then there is a possibility. But otherwise, recommendation is not in the favor of though. Happening and all we are giving, but not this IVIG. Uh, yes, thank Dr. you, thank you. Can I? Yes. Uh, Dr. Tanki, please. Guideline twenty twenty two. Uh, it recommends that with four losses. Ah uh, yes, four, four losses. Desperate conditions. You uh, and the the recommendation is conditional, like you have to explain and yes, okay. conditional. Yeah. Very early four pregnancy losses. Four. That, that is what four. in India I think we are following, but uh, still everybody cannot afford this cost. Yeah, yes. definitely. Yes. so it's very expensive for early pregnancy losses not the late losses and ibig has to be loose used with a lot of caution uh, okay. and we cannot be suggesting it to our patients routinely uh, there is a lot of patients come for this intra lipid administration uh, would any of our panelists want to take on uh, intra lipid i mean does it uh, yes, you think i that... have personally used intra lipid with ivig in one or two of my patients of recurrent pregnancy loss ivf recurrent pregnancy loss first trimester those patients i have used so intra lipid what uh, i have used is that uh on uh, day of embryo transfer and then on sixth day of embryo transfer and once the pregnancy is confirmed then every time with uh, this uh, ivig every time that that costs only 500 rupees so that is not a cost problem but never used it alone yes but as far as the, the uh, we no still i don't have very no high recommendation mm -hmm. unless it's an ivf conception only we they mm -hmm. may use it but we still are not very clear on use of intra lipid not for very clear actually pregnancy not losses yes. so there are still <laughs> controversies that need more uh, research for us to have guidelines i mean i think not as dr tamkin said that in desperate situations after yes. taking a proper consent from the patient we may go ahead with when there is uh, nothing to lose right that is the situation thank you so much uh, thank you so much so i think uh, today we've uh, had wonderful panelists giving us uh, 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 we've learned a lot and we've also learned that apla yes needs to be done uh, uh, the thrombophilia screen is mostly in research context let's not push our patients for that cytogenetic analysis yes uh, as dr shagun brought about we must do uh, depending on the period of gestation autopsy should be done and of course the type of test we need to order whether it's microarray or whole exome will depend on the findings cervical screening is a must uh, in cases that are high risk and have had previous mid trimester losses or preterm birth progesterone yes in previous uh, abortions with bleeding ivig and intra lipid is still controversial so uh, this is where we stand as far as our rectum pregnancy loss is concerned uh thank you so much uh, our wonderful panelists for those wonderful questions is there any additional inputs uh, uh, you could add on one last i would just like to uh, what i read through the ashri you know guidelines 2022 apart from you know the lifestyle modification for the husband was that each and every you know case of rpl should be evaluated for adenomyosis 
Yes. Dr. Khurana that, brought that out. Like, in I his... don't know why we talk. didn't think of it because we always have implicated fibroids, but why we did not think about, you know, adenomyosis. Yes, so sir, Khurana sir brought that out very clearly in his talk that adenomyosis definitely needs to be considered in cases of rectum. Thank you for that input. Thank you, Dr. Alok Varshne, for being my uh, co-moderator. And thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, so, much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Khurana, Khurana sir, can we have additional inputs from you, please? Yes, I thought we'll, like, we'll answer these questions. But the one thing first input I want to give everybody is that not every meta-analysis meta is a reliable piece of research. Yes. Yes. That there is a tendency today to pick up garbage from everywhere and put it together and recycle it and make it appear holier than thou. So for instance, if we look at circlages, uh, uh, you know, transvaginal circlages, not the abdominal ones, there is almost no circlage that is ever done without the use of vaginal progesterone. So who's to know how much was the stitch and how much was the progesterone? When we dropped the Arabian pessary from the FMF trial, or we dropped the FMF trial really, everybody after that Arabian pessary was using cervical progesterone except one center by our friend Carrera in Spain. And she was the only one who would use pure pessary without progesterone. And yet, everybody lumps all this together. So we must understand that a meta-analysis in many situations is not something that you and me must always go by. You have to look at the heterogeneity of the data and then decide whether it's good or not. The second thing in a pregnancy loss is that it's such an emotional event that if you didn't do something and it didn't work out, that's a tragedy. And in our part of the world, they will go for a second, a third, and a 55th opinion. And nasty as we are, we will always say, oh, didn't they give you this? As if, oh, I'm the best. And then you go and have a miscarriage with, with the consultant number seven. So, of course, as consultants, we should never ever, or as practitioners, we should never ever uh, talk like this. But the fact is that it happens. So if you do it, you're in trouble. And if you don't do it, you're in trouble. So what again adds up in, in, in cases of these situations is to let them know clearly, look, the evidence is also gray. What I'm offering you is also gray. You have to choose between the devil and the deep blue sea. I love you very much. I will pray for your baby and it might just work out right. But that bit of counseling and those 10, 15 minutes to be spent in counseling these patients to say that, look, you could go home and, 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 and visit your most favorite religious place every day and you will carry yourself through, should also be given as an option. That if we do nothing, that's also an option in this situation. Now, after all, we have seen patients with six and seven millimeters of a cervix carry on and need a cesarean because the rest of the cervix never opened up. So that is the first thing when we look at research on the meta-analysis. The second thing is to look at how much spurious vaginal progesterone we now have on the market. It is just amazing how much we have. And, uh, you know, with due apologies, but our drug controllers are able to do nothing about it, either at the central or the state level. And therefore, we get stuck. And then we have governments telling us, do not prescribe proprietary medication. And if I don't write proprietary medication, you never know where the progesterone is coming from. And some people are even told that the imported progesterone is very good. Now, how is one supposed to figure this out? The only way we must, all of us, tell the government that, hello, stop branding the medication and we will write, uh, you know, we will not write brand names, we will write proprietary names. It's as simple as that. So each one of us might fight that at our own level. Beyond that, of course, we do realize that there is this world of empirical treatment, which we cannot afford to ignore because patients would do anything provided we counsel them and we get them to write that they've accepted this. So those would be my little words of wisdom if I can add those. Thank you so much, sir. Profound, profound. Yeah. Thank you. And then there's a whole lot of questions in the chat box. Who's doing the questions today? I couldn't... Uh, Zima. Because there's a few questions to be answered, quite a few questions in the okay. chat box. So, uh, right. 
So, sir, there is a question uh, for volume calculation of endometrial cavity in septate uterus. Is it for yes. entire cavity or is it for one half, right or left? That's yeah, question it's question from Dr. Anupam Bhalla. That's right. So, we will measure the entire cavity, uh, the right as well as the left and whatever is in between uh, with the 3D volume calculation. Not just one. And then there was this other question where I needed to explain the embryology. Mm. And then you can't have a oh, hemi mm. mm. without without uh, a rudimentary horn. But because the ovaries embryologically develop completely separately, mm. you could have no uterus and two ovaries and one uterus and the opposite ovary. And those are the really tough ones because then we need to uh, to sort of fast track those to IVF because if you have a left hemi uterus and you have a right ovary, then obviously it's, there's little or no chance that it's going to work. And then uh, there's also some very uh, other interesting questions from that point of view. And one was uh, about the uh, uh, about the question of uh, how much autopsies help. And I'm so glad we answered that beautifully. That look, we try and get as much phenotype information in the first trimester on the basis of ultrasound, and in the second and in the third trimester on the basis of at least um, a, a clinical photograph. Uh, of the products, or um, if we can add on to that a radiograph and and uh, store DNA like uh, like Shagun told us. So I think that would be really nice. We also must remind ourselves that uh, we finished our recruiting for the hundred autopsies that we did in the SFM program uh, for uh, for uh, fetal deaths in general, but uh, that we will restart this with several of our trade partners where we will continue to have free services for uh, fetuses that require genetic attention. Uh, uh, and you can get their a reference number from, from the central office. So that is a program we which, which we will start on a regular basis because I think by the time we add up the cost of autopsy and genetics, it really gets quite expensive. What I would also request Shagun to lead is how much microarray, how much karyotype, when karyotype, and parents or fetus, and also how much exome sequencing straight away. So I think we will need guidelines because the guidelines are so confusing. Also, whether in this day and age, does microarray have a role? I mean, in Germany, they just do a different microarray like what we've only now gotten used to, uh, where Actually, they had a completely different microarray, uh, which they never used, and then an exome, which we have never used. And now the exome, which is available for us at the same cost or cheaper, is actually an exome that uh, sequences far deeper if I can use the word. And that's the word that, that non-genetics understands. So I think we will need that as a guideline. And may I request you to really take this forward, because a lot of the questions uh, pertain to that. The one question that we still haven't paid attention to is the role of the vaginal swab culture and sensitivity in these. And I really want the panel to talk a little more about that if possible. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Meena. We are, we, are not, we are not routinely doing this in all the patients, but patients with a history of preterm, uh, we are most of the times giving them vaginal these prebiotics. But still, if there is any not doing culture in all the patients and then giving. That is not what we are currently doing. Yes. Dr. Uh, Thamkin, if you can add something. Yes. So uh, regarding stillbirths, uh, there's definite evidence that uh, group B streptococcal colonization does, you know, cause uh, stillbirths or and neonatal morbidity and mortality. So if you extrapolate that to the recurrent pregnancy loss, I think we need to do many, many more studies. Uh, but uh, to implicate a cause, uh, a, a bacteria which is there in the vagina or in the, uh, you know, the rectal swab, it is not necessary that it is there. So it is causing the, the pregnancy loss. You have to confirm, for example, for stillbirth, you have to confirm it with amniocentesis as well as placental culture, as well as lung tracheal aspirate from the baby or ear swab from the baby and the blood culture of the baby. Then only you can connect all those together that the bacteria was there and this caused this problem. So it is very difficult to establish and we need to do a, you know more studies on that. Uh, 
then only I think. And like uh, I think Dr. Sita already said, Sita or Dr. Poonam said that uh, it, a single, uh, you know, it will not cause recurrent pregnancy loss. Infections like malaria, like listeria, they all cause pregnancy losses, but they will not be responsible for recurrent pregnancy losses. Excellent. And uh, I think it's really been a very enlightening session. So uh, I, is there any question left in the question box? I don't think we have any. We One have a <laughs> yes, have Dr. Tamkin, yes, go ahead. Dr. Shagun uh, said that this was already a case with a uh, chromosomal line abnormality. So you said she needed an autopsy, which was refused. So when we already had a diagnosis, why we needed an autopsy <laughs> in addition to... No, I think for this case, I did not, I mean, I didn't say that this case needed an autopsy. It yeah. would have been good mm -hmm. to have the autopsy, of course, for additional information. I was saying in general, like any loss uh, beyond the first trimester, even if single, without an identifiable mm -hmm. obstetric cause, needs an autopsy for sure. For no, Dr. Shagun, can, can't we test the placenta? Uh, placenta's uh, genetic placenta makeup may not... Morphism is not in... Every matlab, that is very rare, I think. So, uh, no, but <laughs> genetic workup we can do from placenta, from umbilical cord, from uh, skin biopsy, and all that's not the problem. Like the genetic uh, workup, but the problem is the phenotyping. Like, you no, know, like okay. unless we know the detailed phenotype, uh, like especially tests like microarray and exome, they give so many variants. So, to correlate, we need that information. That's what got it. Got it. Yeah. There's one last question yeah, before we shut. Yeah. One last question before we shut our webinar. And this is from mm -hmm. Sri Lakshmi. Uh, how to explain ambiguous genitalia in trisomy 9? Uh, Dr. Shagun uh, So that, uh, that could be part of it. I mean, uh, as a kind of a DSD kind of a thing, it need not be like related to a hormonal pathway or anything. It's part of a malformation of the genitalia. So yeah, that can be there in trisomy. Yeah, it looks like hypospadias actually. Yeah, yeah, rather yeah. than truly, yeah, it's truly been a fantastic session, and I'm so glad we could actually um, get our forces together between the Safe Motherhood Committee and uh, our, our very own Society Field Medicine, so that we could satisfy the needs of a much larger audience. Uh, this, of course, as usual, uh, will be on our YouTube channel in about four to six weeks after we've got all the permissions and. Um, I take this chance to thank everyone. I, any last words from Mohit before we uh, shut tonight? No, you know, the, what was mesmerizing was the kind of discussion we've had today. In-depth, insightful. I just love this program. When you talk about recurrent pregnancy loss, very often you think of what will you discuss. Eventually it's lost. But then you had so much to contribute today. And I'm sure people will be watching this YouTube channel again and again. This is a very insightful uh, you know, webinar I've heard today. Thank you so much, panelists. And I should appreciate you, sir. You just came back from Faridabad and you're doing this webinar. Hats off to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, so Thank much. you Dr. Poonam. We are looking you, forward Dr. for much more collaborations Please. like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Bye-bye. Thank you and good night. Good night, good night everyone. Good night. Good night.